a great novelist doesn't sit down and think, what does my reader think of this? A great novelist thinks about, what's the story I have to tell? I have to tell. This is The Talent Show, a new podcast series from FT Talent, a hub of innovation from the Financial Times. It's hosted by under 30s for the under 30s around the world. This second series is about all the aspects the FT organization is covering today, from editorial to development, from data to talent. I am Virginia Stagni, and this is a guide we designed to inspire you to be the one driving innovation and change. Welcome to the show. All right, another episode of our talent show here at Bracken House. London is a lovely sunny day and is even sunnier because today I have Martin Wolf with me. How are you, Martin? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So Martin is our chief economics commentator and hopefully we're going to have a nice time together today. Martin, would you like to tell us a bit more about your role? So what does it mean to be a chief economics commentator at the Financial Times? And my main job is to write columns. I write one weekly column, um, which I inherited from a very distinguished predecessor in 1996. So I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, and uh, my job is to write this main column, which is predominantly, though not exclusively, on economic matters, and particularly the world economy and sometimes the British economy. Um, in many different dimensions, but I also do some geopolitics and geoeconomics, climate um, and even security and other questions. And then I have a weekly column, a bi-weekly column, so once a fortnight, on um, the British economy. And apart from that, I write occasional pieces of various kinds, um, uh, big reads and things of this kind. And I'm involved more broadly in the discussion of the economic views of the paper, um, in editorial conferences, in talking to my colleagues. That's basically what the role is. And I've read that you mentioned many times that you happened to be in financial journalism, but you're, uh, at the beginning of your career path, you were really immersed in economics and, uh, of course, uh, being a professional and economist. How did this transition into journalism happened? Well, in my case, this is why I don't have a career path anyone can follow, because it was an accident. The whole thing is an accident. Um, as you say, I, when I left Oxford, which is now uh, a little over half a century ago, which seems extraordinary, um, I went to work for the World Bank as an economist. I worked there for 10 years in various roles. My biggest role was as senior divisional economist on India back in the middle of the 70s. And after that, I moved to work for the think tank on trade policy, uh, mostly involved actually in background work on what became the Uruguay round, which was the last big trade negotiating round in world economic history, actually, up to now, created the World Trade Organization. So I was very involved in that. And this institution failed, um, just ran out of money as things happen. I had to decide what to do next. And completely out of the blue, uh, this is in 1987, the then editor of the FT, Sir Jeffrey Owen, um, whom I got to know and I'd written pieces for him and I'd written uh, commentary and letters for him, simply asked me completely out of the blue whether I would like to join the newspaper as um, chief editorial writer. And I had a number of other options, going into the city, going into academia, going back to the World Bank, uh, that interested me. But this struck me as just more fun, more exciting, and more of a challenge than anything else. So I said yes, and that's it. Let's say that you need to take this decision now with uh, all the technological and digital uh, uh, disruptions that we have seen in the recent years. Uh, would you uh, take the same decision to go into journalism or do you see other career paths or ecosystems where you would like, you know, to tap into if you had the opportunity? I think in being British, I would probably still make the same choice if it's available to you. It's a freak. I mean, very few people are offered this choice. There are very few outlets for serious economic writing of my of my kind. Um, 
But if there is, a, there's still an FT, obviously, it still has the impact it has, despite all the changes. Of course, it's now doing lots of things in a different way with podcasts and all the rest of it. But it still has extraordinary reach. I can write books as well. So I'm not limited by this. So I would make the same choices. But obviously now, um, there are other ways you might go think about going about doing this. So if you, for instance, get an academic position, you can create a sub stack. Um, 15 years ago, it would have been a blog. Uh, and if you're really good at it, you can get very widely read and very influential. There are quite a number of people I know well who've made a real success of this. I could imagine doing that. But I really enjoy being part of the FT. I enjoy my colleagues. I enjoy the range of things they're interested in. Um, journalists are very interesting people, by and large, very knowledgeable without being very dryly and narrowly academic. Um, they're not obsessed with uh, managerial questions. So it's a wonderful environment, and it's very fertilizing. So I find talking to people is wonderful in in uh, getting one new ideas. Can imagine being in a think tank, particularly in America, maybe the Kennedy School, Brookings, something like that. There are fewer things like that here. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Blavatnik School in Oxford now. So as a base, and then doing opinion writing as I do, and I know people who do that. So that's a combination. I think would now be something I'd think about quite seriously. 30, 40 years ago when I started, that really wasn't available in the same way. And you have really been a part of the digital transition that the FT has been through. And you as um, as a journalist, as a commentator, so being on the content side, um, how did you see this transition in uh, the digital uh, and digitalization of the FT paper um, changing your perspective on the audience? Well, actually, I'm going to disturb you by saying not much. Uh, and there's a reason for this. I've thought about it. I'm writing opinion. And these are interesting only to the extent that they are my opinions and they're soundly based. Because that's what makes them interesting. I'm not interesting. My opinions and the quality of the arguments and facts based on them are what make them interesting. That's my prime job, mm -hmm. is to serve that task. It's an internal process. It's not an external process. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, a great artist doesn't think about the audience. A great artist mm -hmm. thinks, I'm not saying I'm a great artist, let me care, thinks about yeah. what he or she has to do to bring about forth his or her vision. Um, and I mean this in music and literature or anything else. You know, a great novelist doesn't sit down and think, what does my reader think of this? A great novelist thinks about what's the story I have to tell? I have to tell. Well, I feel the same way about my columns. I write columns because this is a story I have to tell, that I care about. And I hope that the, the audience will find it interesting. If they don't, they should stop doing it. And this, so this is about being authentically true to yourself and to the, the task that you've set yourself. Now, the danger, I think, about being um, too concerned about who your audience is and what the audience feel about you and do they like you or not is it's paralyzing. Because you, you obviously can't interest them all. You can't satisfy them all. Some, some things will satisfy them and some of the people, things I write, they will hate. And that's fine. So, the, um, so I think the great danger of pursuing um, the audience consciously is that it dilutes the integrity or authenticity of what you are, what you're doing. I'm... The editors of the paper are clearly have to think about the audience and they have to have writers writing for the paper who are appealing to the audience. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that the writers need to think about the audience. The I writers need to think, above all, certainly opinion writers, mm -hmm. about what it is they're trying to say and why it matters. I feel that the subjects I write about are very important to most people, so they ought to be interested. I hope that comes over. I also feel that if they disagree passionately with what I say, that's good. 
not bad, fine, uh, um, because it gives them a touchstone against which to measure their own views. Uh, and I feel that by and large, at least in opinion writing, the people I respect are people who are true to themselves, which is certainly what I've tried to be, true to their ideas, their op values, their opinions, their histories, whatever it is that makes them an interesting person. Um, so the, the organization has to think about the audience. It has to have writers who appeal to the audience and other people who appeal to the audience. It has different media. We use podcasts. That doesn't change things much. It's like doing a, a radio interview. We used to do lots of them when we, we had those. Um, but in the end, authenticity is what is needed in a writer and above all, an opinion writer. And that is about being true to oneself. And so in the end, you know, so I like being employed here, but I'm perfectly happy to understand that at some point an editor will say, that stops, you, you've done enough, and we, it's no longer live, that's fine. Um, the, the crucial thing is I must be true to myself, and the value of what I write comes from the fact that I actually believe in it and have worked on it and care about it. And I think when you need it and you still find and face some backlashes for what you're writing some of the times, right? I guess uh, you read the, com the comments of your column? Or? Sometimes, uh, often not, because they they just go on forever repeating familiar complaints, uh, which I know about. I mean, I read comments if I think that this is a subject I haven't written about before. I don't know really mu that much about it. I might learn from the comments. But I take the view, essentially, that I have worked out what I think. I know very well, very well, that there are lots of people who disagree with this position, including FT readers, and they're going to express at great length their, why they disagree with me. Um, I don't think they, I mean, I occasionally look at it, they're not going to present me with an argument I've never heard of before because I've been around a long time and I've heard all the arguments. So I think it's absolutely fine that they can express their views and other people can think I'm absolutely terrible, and that's fine. Were you so confident at the beginning of your career? Um, no, I think the answer is... I you know, first of all, I worked as a bureauc bureaucracy. It was a completely different thing. It was about satisfying your bosses, which I didn't particularly like, though I was pretty good at it. Um, and the uh, and uh, but in the um, when I moved into the opinion writing role, work role here, which and I've been here now, what is it? Uh, 36 years, which is a long time. And I've been in this role for 27, which is a ridiculously long time almost for this role. Um, I took me a while to develop a sort of philosophy about what I was trying to do and why. And I think I did some columns at the beginning in the first year or two, which were not really authentic. Um, for instance, uh, there is a style of columnist who who says, I think, I'm not sure, says to themselves, what is the consensus of opinion today? Now, how can I argue against it? So this isn't about what they think. This is about how can they express an argument that is contrary to the dominant con conventional wisdom? And that's a perfectly fine thing to do. But I decided, I did a few columns like that in the early years, I really didn't like it. It just didn't interest me to do that. Um, but that's one way of t approaching it. Uh, or you can simply take the view, what is the most controversial position I can possibly advance on this topic and write that. And that's also a way of being an opinion writer and there are plenty of those too. But my view was, as I developed this, is I have a certain abilities to analyze things. That's the best thing I'm at. I'm clear when I analyze things. I understand pretty well how to use data to support an argument. What I need to do is explain as best I can what I think the situation is. And, um, and of course, follow from that certain conclusions about what should be done about it. So I try to write things that I think are accurate and truthful, convincing, I hope. Um, I'm not writing for effect. I'm not writing to annoy people or I'm just trying to do this job 
of providing clear analysis and exposition as well as I can. And in for our readers and for the FT, that is, I think, a valuable role. And once I'd realized that's my role, well, that's what I do. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I like doing that. But it comes back then to this question of authenticity. This means that I'm, it is authentic in the sense that it is what I think. It is what I believe. It is what, based on the research I've done and the reading I've done, um, which can always be wrong, but it is sort of honest in that sense. And in the end, the readers um, have to decide whether this interests them or not, and that's entirely up to them. I think what you're, what we are learning from you today, it's the importance of understanding your ethos in your job and finding your own whys and uh, making very clear uh, what 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 you're standing for. And uh, I believe, and I've read that before going into the PPE course in Oxford, you started with a classics, right? Um, do you think uh, um, studying classics gave you a foundation around? Um, finding your whys, the ontology of things, or do you, um, do you ever go back to classics, maybe sometimes when, uh, when you are writing or you're thinking about big issues? Well, first of all, my classical education was an immensely important part of my life. Um, from the age of 15 to the age of 21, um, I basically did nothing but Latin and Greek. Uh, so, and I read a lot of it. Uh, the ideas and culture that I absorbed at that time um, is, and also the way of working. Um, classics is wonderful for teaching you precision in language and precision in facts. Uh, so um, these are important to me on a daily basis. Uh, I, I, I would be completely different. Uh, without it. I think classics also, which is very valuable, taught me to think from within uh, about what it will be to live in a completely different culture. So the, you know, it's a real immersion in the literature and thinking of a culture which is related to ours, but also profoundly different, pre-Christian, for example. Mm -hmm. So this was incredibly important, and I think it's been very helpful to me in trying to get some idea of what non-Western cultures are like. Um, because actually in some ways, to you know, famous example, the, the, the world of the ancient Greeks and the world of mo pre-modern Japan are quite similar. So it's yeah. quite helpful, quite helpful, yeah. uh, just to force yourself to get away from standard Western Christian um, ways of thinking yeah. and that analysis. So classics was unbelievably important, and it constantly returns in my most recent book, which I've also written about in the paper, which is uh, on the crisis of democratic capitalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the two most important thinkers that I've relied upon in this book are Plato and Aristotle. So the answer, obviously, is that those thinkers, who are, I think, the best writers on politics there have ever been in the Western tradition, um, that uh, these writers uh, remain, uh, remain living and real for me. And I think I will be an incomparably narrower human being and much worse at doing what I do, which goes way beyond technical economics, if I hadn't had that education, for which I'm very, very thankful. I think, you know, when uh, when you know the roots of words as well, like uh, studying the etymology of uh, uh, how we define things around us, it's it's really important in giving in giving us the sense of clarity. I, I studied classics as well, and then I moved to economics, and uh, I found it so helpful uh, to really understand the meaning of things, right? Um, but today, um, I get a lot of this argument every time, uh, you know, we're discussing about this. Shall I go into, you know, a bit more uh, technical um, um, journey in my academia? Now that you, you know, you can go into uh, science, you should study data and so on. Let's say that we need to suggest uh, to a younger person that is uh, picking their university courses. Would you recommend them to go uh, and uh, try the, the road of uh, classics or you say no go go and do like I did uh, economics or um, try something that is a bit of a hybrid or at least what is your suggestion for someone that is uh, um, in a bit more scientific uh, academic uh, journey uh, to pick that classics 
knowledge because I find it very difficult if you don't know how to translate and that takes ages. I mean, without the five years of uh, knowing Aoristo, what it is and the verbs and so on, you cannot really go further. Well, I it is really extraordinary to think this, but I started Latin at the age of eight and I started Greek, I think, at the age of 11. So even before that period, I'd done a lot. And by the time I was at Oxford studying classics, I could read um, Homer pretty fluently. I couldn't do that now, unfortunately, so I don't read the, it now in the way that I did. Uh, the uh, It's very hard. The languages are hard and, and, and quite foreign. Um, so I think the uh, the broad answer I would give is, you know, I have three children and two of them did sciences and one did classics. So we've had a diverse uh, response uh, in my own children. So the, the answer to this is I do think this is personal. I don't think there's a general answer. Um, the uh, It depends on the person's abilities and the person's interests. I think. It's difficult to do things you really hate just because it's good for career. I, I recommend against it. Any parent, and I also have a lot of grandchildren, I can see that the children are all different. So people are different and they should do things that work for them and not work for other people or work for because the parents want to do them to do it. Then the second thing they have to decide is what sort of thing do they want to do in life, and which is, of course more difficult now. I don't think it's more difficult, but it's always been it's been difficult now for a long time because, the, as you already suggested, the world is changing so much. So the jobs that seem obvious now may be completely different 15 years from now. And who knows what artificial intelligence is going to do to the job market. So that makes it very difficult to predict. So I tend to think you should try and get the best education you can doing things that interest you and the, that are important to you. Um, and then see what happens after that. My life wasn't planned. It's a series of accidents. I got into ac economics by more or less by accident. I can discuss that too. I got went to the World Bank, certainly by accident. I just applied and I was very surprised to get accepted. The FT came by accident. Unless you're the, you know, I tend to divide young people into two categories in this respect. I mean, talking about the sort of people who could think of doing what we're doing, who have some academic talent and so forth. Um, there are people, young people, who know from the age of seven or eight what they want to do. My father was one. He wanted, to, from the age of eight, to be a playwright. And it's often with musicians it's like this. If you're going to be a real musician, you already know when you're a child. And then there are other people like me who didn't know. I had lots of different ideas, for, and that's most people, I think. Um, then you have to, to, I say, get the best education you can in things you care about, that interest you, that intrigue you, that engage you, um, and then see where it leads you and take the opportunities as they arrive. Don't have a plan because mostly plans fail. You will find you don't like it. Uh, it isn't what you really wanted to do. Uh, I found that when I was working in the World Bank. I enjoyed it very much, but I didn't want to spend my life working in an institution like that, and I never went back into one, and, but I could have. I could have worked in the Treasury or the Bank of England, much happier at the Financial Times. Uh, so this is personal. Go to things that interest you and excite you. Now, not everybody will have these choices. I understand that very well. But that's the the life plan I have suggested to my children and to other people. Get the best education you can in the fields that interest you. If it's science and tech, that's wonderful. And if it isn't, that's also wonderful. And move on and move on in directions, taking one thing at a time. And it's amazing what will might emerge out of it. Um, what accidents there might be in your life, which will be exciting and wonderful. Life is not planable. Uh, um, you can have an aspiration, but life is not planable. The people you will be with are not planable. Uh, that's what makes life enjoyable, is sheer impossibility to plan and manage. How can you prepare yourself in trying to predict what comes next in such a cybernetic, fast-paced world? 
Oh, I think you can't. Um, well, some people are much better than others uh, at this, though I think very few are completely um, reliable. I don't consider myself uh, an extraordinary forecaster in any way, though I think I have had some sense of some things. Um, but the basic view I take of what I do and what anybody who's doing something like this is, is have a very, very wide perspective on the possible events. Mm -hmm. To me, the most important basis of that single basis is knowledge of history, is the knowledge of what has happened. Do not ever assume that the world of today is normal and will go on forever, because it, it normally isn't, as it were, and it won't. Ask yourself how it could change and what will change it. Um, consider the various zo rain regions of uncertainty around us. Right at the moment, it's pretty easy to do because there are so many. And realize that as a result, what the world is actually going to look like 10, 20, 30 years from now is wildly unpredictable. Um, so much has happened in my lifetime that nobody expected. Some things that have happened have been reasonably predictable. Economic change itself, technological progress itself. Um, but some of that has been not what we expected and hoped, and some of it has been more. Um, the, uh, we can, in other words, consider the range of possibilities, try to form a view of how they might evolve, while always understanding that the rain, the, the regions of uncertainty are so wide and pervasive that you will never get this right. And that's, again, part of what makes the world so fascinating to look at. If we knew what was going to happen to ourselves and to the world, it would be so stupefyingly boring. Having that um, open mindset, I've read uh, your um, your piece on uh, um, on the concept of home for you. Uh, that was a very touching one that I highly recommend, and we're going to put it on the show notes for you guys to uh, read again. Um, did your family influence you in having this open mindset, especially uh, based on the very roots of your family and their background of your mom and dad? Yes, uh, I do recommend also, if it's if it is available, a piece I wrote on my father, which was published yeah. in 2010. Um, well, uh, yes, my as I've explained in some of my writing, though I t tend not to be autobiographical, uh, um, and in my recent book, in its preface, the, my, my, our family history is very important uh, to me, um, and my parents were incomparably the biggest influence upon me which I think is probably fairly common. Um, uh, but in, if one's parents are not the biggest influence upon one, one probably has had a very, very bad relationship with them, which would be a tragedy um, uh, because it is the formative relationship of every human life, uh, isn't it? Um, uh, so uh, the... Uh, um, answer is my parents were both refugees. Uh, they came here um, before or in the middle of the Second World War. My father from Vienna, my mother from Holland. Um, they were Jewish and uh, uh, they came obviously to escape death as most of their families were killed in the Holocaust. They were the ones who stayed behind their aunts, uncles, and cousins. Their immediate family survived. My parents moved here. My father had been a playwright, as I already indicated, in Austria and Germany, but that sort of ended, and he ended up doing radio broadcasting. He worked for the BBC, for German service for many years. He worked for German television and did television plays. That's how he developed. But he was a, an almost classic Central European intellectual, uh, um, he went to one of the most famous gymnasiums in Vienna, actually the one that Schubert went to a uh, hundred years earlier, uh, Franz Schubert went to. And my mother was Dutch, and like all Dutch people, spoke English very well. So they, they brought me up and their values and their personal life and their ideas uh, shaped me in um, belief in democracy, in the Enlightenment, in... 
um, in hostility, obviously, to authoritarianism and fascism, um, all very, very important and made me very interested in public life and politics. And I got into economics because I was interested in politics. It seemed to me you couldn't understand politics without understanding economics. And it worked very well for me. PP worked very well for me. So that family background, both the people they were, the values they had, and their history have shaped me. And they've made me, and I think this is one asset, really aware of the fragility of human uh, civilization and human life. Um, obviously, the first half of the 20th century in Europe, which ended, as it were, you know, just before I was, just as I was born, was shattering period in which uh, tens and tens of millions of people were killed. And uh, I'm always aware of this. Uh, it's part of my background to be aware of the, the catastrophe out of which we came and into which, quite obviously, one can always return. So that has shaped me. Um, probably makes me uh, more anxious about things in a way than than most others would be. I, I don't take things for granted, but perhaps also more aware of possibilities than others would be. I think, it, by in the end, of course, every human being, no human being invents him or herself. You're all was the product of the people before you and the people around you. And that's why I don't really... I know we think a lot about generations and how different we are, um, but actually the background history of me and the background of history of people two generations later is more or less the same. After all, it's only two generations different out of thousands. Uh, we're all human. We are all experience much the same sort of human problems. Uh, uh, they are, of course, society changes in interesting and in the whole quite exciting ways. But I think the idea that there's something fundamentally different as human being between someone born in 1990 and someone born in, in the 1940s is just wrong. We're all human. I really agree with you because I think we always forget about this anthropological view on uh, people and society and just thinking about, you know, the values. And I think in this chat, we really touch on authenticities, finding your whys. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, we can have all our personal choices and journeys. But uh, as, as you were mentioning, uh, we are here with uh, the same problems or uh, the same questions. As I said, Martin, the very last part of this podcast is the two questions from um, two uh, young challengers and students that uh, came here to the Financial Times today to ask you two uh, little questions that we hope you can answer to. So let's welcome here um, Dylan and uh, Irmak. So uh, Dylan, uh, you are a member of the PPE LSE Society, aren't you? Yes, so uh, my name's Dylan, uh, currently second year uh, PPE student at the LSE and I'm currently the president of PPE Society for this year. Uh, that's been a great opportunity. We've um, uh, had a uh, had a number of guest speakers from uh, David Liddington to uh, uh, Emily Thornbury this year, and we've also organised um, you know debates within the society. So that's been great. So my my question is about applying what you've learned. You did um, PPE and then a masters in economics. Is there anything that you've learned that you feel like you've used the most in your career? Um. Oh, that's interesting. I probably, uh, what I learned um, that I use most directly is when I did the MPhil in economics, which was sort of basic economic theory and the, um, and the framework of thinking in a general equilibrium context. It forces you to think through certain sorts of problems um, and in ways that are very helpful when dealing with real world situations. And so on a practical basis, that's probably the most important set of things I've learned. And uh, Irmak, I know you are on uh, the same uh, path of studies, aren't you? Yes, yeah? exactly. Uh, my name is Irmak. I'm a second year PP student at LSE as well. And I'm the secretary of the LSE SUPP Society. So I've been helping Dylan with all the hard work that we've done on organizing debates and speaker events. Uh, and my question for Martin Wolf today is as follows. Uh, so you talked a lot about 
authenticity and being able to have a vision um, and forming a vision that's like, you know, true to yourself. So, um, and you cite a lot of different sources from academic papers, reports and interviews in your journalism. What is your main source of inspiration and how has your worldview on the wider economy changed over the course of your career? I think that by now, the main source of inspiration for me seems to be internal because I've internalized so much. So the, there are exceptions. Sometimes I read one thing which seems to me a sort of an inspiring view of a specific phenomenon, and that can set me off. Uh, but that I can give examples of columns in which I've done that. But more often by now, um, I've internalized an immense amount of material, history, views, my past views. My history is long now uh, as an adult. So it's really the interaction between me as I have emerged from all this experience and what's going on in the world. So I, I read the newspapers, I follow the events, and I say, what do I think about this? What's important here? You know, cost of living crisis. What do I think about that? What's, what's going on here? Then, once I've done that, and I've got a kernel of an idea, I then go and start looking at the research reports, the analyses, the things that I rely on. And obviously there are some things that are more useful than others. And there are some events which are triggered, columns that are triggered by specific reports. But essentially, a lot of what I do is internally driven now. It's, is this important? And what have I got to say on it, which it might be worth doing? And then you start doing the research, if you feel there's a lot of additional research to do, which in my case, there often is because I like to get data and so forth. But at, at some point in your life, I think this must be true of anyone doing a craft, um, it comes from within. It's you. Uh, and I think that is what makes it interesting to you. And if you've got any luck, it's because it's interesting to you, it'll also be interesting to others. Thank you so much. Thank you for your questions. And of course, uh, thank you so much, Martin, uh, for being with us today and uh, sharing all your insights and also personal journey with us and the audience. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Check the show notes. We are going to link the all the different pieces that we referred to during this episode and up to the next uh, episode of The Challenge Show. Thank you. This has been The Talent Show, which is produced by the FT Talent Team, Aya Al-Shihabi, and me, Virginia Stani. Our podcast producer, editor, and sound engineer is Arturo Ochoa, and our social media producer is Letizia Clementi. Our music is by Dennis Kishuk. Check out all of the Talent Show episodes at fttalent.ft.com, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and follow FT Talent on socials for updates. Until next time, and keep listening. Keep listening.